Yes. All right, let's start with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, as we talk about the close of probation today, I pray that you would uh, have mercy on us. Um, as I lead out in this presentation, I pray that you would forgive me of my sins, Lord, and that if I say or do anything in this presentation that's either wrong or a mistake, that you would uh, guide minds and lead them into your truth, that you would lead all of us into your truth. And Lord, uh, the events that are getting ready to transpire of, of the greatest import and interest, and I ask, Lord, that you would have mercy upon us at this time as we study this really, really important event. And I pray that you would uh, take control, that you would put words in my mouth that would be instructive and uplifting. We're going to do quite a bit of Bible studies today. Um, first thing we're going to do is we're going to turn to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. Um, you know, as Seventh-day Adventists, we have a lot of these various beliefs and stuff, but we don't always have the easiest methodology in which to present these truths. And um, in the story here of, of Revelation chapter 13, it focuses on these two powers and these two beasts is what they are. And the first beast is receiving of a deadly wound and the second beast comes into the scene and it causes all the earth to follow after the first beast. And we have here a, um, a scenario it says um, in verse 15, Revelation chapter 13 and verse 15, And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause, that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand and in their foreheads, that no man might buy or sell, save he had the mark and the name of the beast and the number of his name. And so what we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about the close of probation, but we're going to talk about also the mark of the beast. Why? Because we teach that through this close of probation, mark of the beast period is when Seventh-day Adventists, well, let me back up for a minute. So as most of us in Adventism believe, there is a general close of probation, but that probation for Seventh-day Adventists is transpiring right up to the general close of probation. And this becomes pretty evident because the Bible tells us that, that where does uh, judgment begin? So then there's a place where it ends, right? And so... We will see here in Ezekiel that in Ezekiel chapter 9 that when judgment takes place on Israel, who does it begin with? The house. It begins with the leaders that stand before the house, right? Because to whom much is given, much is what? Required. So what happens is we will see that there will be a series of events leading to the close of probation. Now we teach, or many teach in Adventism, that the Sunday law is the close of probation for Seventh-day Adventists. And I believe that's true, but I don't believe it's an individual event or an individual day. And I think that as we study out these prophecies, we'll see here that that will, is the case. So while it is true, it's not exactly that easy in regard to this, this one signal event that where everybody's probation closes until Michael stands up in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. So, yes. So, first thing we're going to do is we're going to put here the word mark. Okay? So, 
the, the world, by and large, believes that the mark of the beast is either a tattoo or a chip in your hand and all these kind of things, right? Now, let me be clear. The mark has to do with worship. That's what it says, okay? It has to do with worship. But that doesn't mean that in the future, it were in the near future, that there could be something that those that have the mark will be required to have. Let me explain. In verse 17, it says that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So, what I'm not saying here is that there's not something associated with having the conformity of worship as it applies to the mark of the beast because obviously there's got to be some kind of a recognition, right? So that when you go to the store, well, you don't have the mark, so you can't buy. Can I get an amen there? There's got, I don't know what that mechanism is, and I'm not even going to say it has to be this or it has to be that, but there's got to be something to which you can't gain access unless you have the mark. I mean, it's clearly inferred there. So the question is, what is it? What is the mark? Okay. Now, as Bible students, we, we believe that the mark of the beast has to do with Sunday, okay? Now, what we're trying to do here today is to go through Scripture because no, no prophecy is of any private interpretation, right? Amen. So what we have to do is we have to show what this is from what? The Bible. From the Bible, okay? Now, what we have to do is we have to give an illustration that this has something to do with worship, okay? So as Christians, we believe that everything that was written aforetime is an example for us at the end of the world. Where is that found? Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 4. Verse 11. Yeah. 10, 11. Okay, let's go there really quickly. It's a good exercise to do this. 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 11. And the Bible says, Now all these things happened unto them for, for examples, or examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. And we believe we're at the end of the world, right? Yeah. So we've got to use all these stories in the Bible as what? Yeah. Examples so that we know what's going on. So, in the Bible, there are two stories in the Bible, one at the beginning of the world and one at the end of the world, and both of them have marks in them. Okay? Amen? Amen? So the one at the beginning of the world is going to explain to us what the one is at the end of the world. Amen? Amen. So let's go to the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis. And we're going to start in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 3. Genesis chapter 4 and verse 3. I get really excited about <coughs> Genesis chapter 4, verse 3, because in this story... Cain is claiming to worship God. And he's claiming, as we see, that, that there was a time in the Bible that was prescribed for worshiping God. Okay? And it says in verse 3, in the process of time, it came to pass. Do you know what that means? There was a set time. And in that process... It came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering. But unto Cain and his offering he had not respect. So what happens here is there was a day set up, and, and, and believe me, friends, they were coming to worship before the Lord. Okay? And one had a form of worship that was 
acceptable, and one had a form of worship that wasn't acceptable, and they had it on the same day, in the process of time. And as you study in the book of Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 23, there was a process in which the children of God, or the children of Abraham, were told how to have forgiveness of sins through the sacrificial system on what day they were to do what thing, okay? And on one day you were to, you were to bring a firstling of your flock of the lamb, and on another day you were to bring what? You were to bring first fruits. So if you brought one thing on the wrong day, were you going with God's directive, yes or no? No. no. And so Cain wasn't, his, his sacrifice wasn't respected. Now, there, was there a day in the Bible where it says you're to bring the first fruit? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. But there was also a day when you're to bring the lamb. Amen? Amen. So if you bring one without the other, or if you bring one for instance, did you know on the first fruit day you were also to have a sacrifice? Yeah. So what happens is if you just bring the fruit and, and not the sacrifice, then you're what? You're, you're not worshiping God how God says this is how you do it, right? So in this story, what happens is that one sets up his own worship and it's not respected. Now in the story of what's going on in the book of Revelation, it also talks about worship, and it says that those that wouldn't worship the image of the beast should be what? Killed. Killed. And this is what happens to, to, his, to his brother Abel. And in the story, we see that verse 8, it says, Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? So what we see here is that in the story at the beginning of the world, that if, if, if you set up this false worship system and your brother is telling you, Hey, you need to do what's right in the sight of the Lord. If you do well, then you, the Lord will have respect. What does that cause to happen? Anger and hatred and it leads to murder. And this is what happens in the story of Revelation. This group of people that are the vast majority are saying to these other people, if you don't worship how we are, you're going to die. Amen? Amen? But look here in verse 15. It says, And the Lord said unto him, Therefore whoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should what? Kill him. So we see here that Cain had a mark put upon him. Don't know exactly what it was. You know, uh, some, there's, there's even a phrase in which, uh, how many people have ever heard the term, he's a marked man? Is there a literal mark upon him? I don't know, but maybe there was something. Okay? But we know here that, uh, that Cain started doing things and everybody could tell the difference between the descendants of Cain and the descendants of Abel. And I'll tell you a little secret. Well, the Bible, the Bible tells us right here, it says in verse 17, And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch, and he built a what? And called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. So where did Cain's children dwell in the, city. in the city and what you're gonna see is and especially if you study this thing out that after the flood they were they were living in the mountains and then they went in the plain of Shinar and did what build a city and every time these people go out and build cities it's a bad deal right and the Lord has displeasure in it and what happens here is not only are they living in the cities but you could tell the difference between the, the descendants of Cain and the, the, and the descendants of Adam's other children because guess what they were doing? They were taking multiple wives, their dress was different, their appearance was different, there was a difference, right? So you're going to want to look for all those things in this story back here in Revelation chapter 13 because if you're going to kill your brother over, over this false system of worship, you're going to have these other attributes as well. 
So what's going on here is we see that, that this mark has something to do with worship. Okay? And would it be true worship or false worship? Okay, so we have our first little clue here that if you're engaging in false worship, it's going to make you murderous, but it's going to put a mark on you. It's, you're going to be a marked individual. Because is there any place in the Bible that specifically tells us what the mark of the beast is? It says, this is Sunday worship. There isn't, right? But what we're going to do is we're going to have to kind of crack the code what's in the Bible to figure out exactly what this mark is, right? Okay. So the next thing we're going to do, because, see, let, let's go to Revelation chapter 7. Remember we talked about the fact that at the end of the world that there's two groups of people. You either have the mark of the beast or the seal of God. Well, let's look at the seal of God. Okay. Revelation Chapter 7 and verse 2. We're going to save a little time here. I'd love to go over verse 1 because it talks about the four winds. And maybe we'll get into that later. But let's go to verse 2. Revelation 7, verse 2. And I saw an, another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their what? Foreheads. Foreheads. In. In the foreheads, right? It's not on, it's in. So for those that might be watching that may have a New King James or an NIV version where it says on, well, the King James says in. So here we are in this situation right here where in, uh, in, Re in Revelation, 13, it talks about them receiving a mark in the forehead as well and in the right hand, and these people are sealed in their forehead. So, so we have a story here where you two groups of people, and one has a seal and one has a mark, okay? One has a seal and one has a mark. And we have to ask the question, well, is there a difference between a mark and a seal? We have to ask this question. And we know that these people that have this seal are are in the story of the events going on later on in Revelation, and here's why. Because in verse 4, it says, And I heard the number of them that were sealed, and there were sealed and 144,000 of all the tribes of Israel. So we see that the 144,000 are what? Sealed. Let's go back to Revelation 13. Revelation chapter 13, and we will prove here that, that, um, that they have something to do with what's going on around this time period when the mark of the beast is going on. It says in verse uh, uh, 16, it says, And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand, or, it's an or, or, in their foreheads. Now, it explains how this is all going to go into effect in verse 17 and 18. And then look at verse 1 of chapter 14. It says, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having their father's name written in their what? Foreheads. foreheads. So we know that the seal is in their foreheads and now we see that the name of the Father is where? In their foreheads and lo they're standing there when all these other people have what? The mark of the beast. So the 144,000 are having something to do with being in the time period where the mark of the beast is going out. Amen. So this is how we can say you're either going to have the seal of God or you're going to have the mark of the beast. Okay? But is, the question is, is a mark different from a seal? Well, let's let the Bible tell us. Go with, go with me to Ezekiel chapter 9. Ezekiel chapter 9. 
Because we know at the end of the world that these prophets are speaking more about us at the end of the world than they are in their own day, right? Because everything written aforetime is for us. So we see here that um, in, in Ezekiel chapter 9, verse 1, it says, And he cried also in my ears with a loud voice. That's kind of like a loud cry, right? So this is, this is sort of like the loud cry event. It says, uh, uh, saying, Cause them that have charge over the city to draw near, and every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. And behold, six men came from the higher gate, which lieth towards the north, and every man a slaughter weapon in his hand. Towards the north. Interesting. Am I back? Okay. And I'll repeat verse 2 a little bit. And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth towards the north, and every man a slaughter weapon in his hand. And one man among them was clothed with linen, with a rider's inkhorn by his side. And they went in and stood beside the brazen altar. Where is the brazen altar? It's in the courtyard. Okay? It's in the courtyard. So here are these, these messengers, these angels, this loud cry, uh, uh, that's going on and they're before the brazen altar which is in the courtyard and verse 3 it says and the glory of God of Israel was gone up from the cherub whereupon he was to the threshold of the house and he called to the men clothed with linen which had the writer's inkhorn by his side so if he's where the cherubs are where's that at? that's in the most holy place so he's having this line of communication, he's in the most holy place, and when the Lord is in the most holy place, when the high priest is in the most holy place, what's going on? Day of We're in the antitypical day of atonement here. In other words, judgments are going out, right? And this is what the Lord says in verse 4. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, go through the midst of Jerusalem, the church, and set a mark, where? On the, on the foreheads, the upon. The upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. So we know from, from what the Bible tells us on the Day of Atonement, what are you supposed to be doing? You're supposed to be sighing and crying between the porch and where? Altar. And the altar. This is what's going on here. And what happens is that these angels have what? Mark. A writer's inkhorn. Now, can we see it? No. no. We can't see it. But they can see it because they see what we can't see. And you know what, brothers and sisters? You can see it. Because if you're living a certain way, acting a certain way, and I'm not going to get into some of the other areas, you can see, you can see. A mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And to the others he said in mine hearing, go ye after him. In other words, there's this sealing first. There's this mark time first. And go ye after him through the city and smite. Not, let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women. But come not near any man upon whom is the mark. And begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient of men which were before the house. So, where does judgments come first? The house of God, and it comes to the leadership, okay? So what I'm, I'm telling you this story because I'm going to tell you this, right? And I'm not going to tell you this. The Bible is going to tell you this because, you know, when we hear the word mark, we're like, ooh, that's bad because we associate it with the mark of the beast. But here in Ezekiel chapter 9, if you don't have the mark, you're in trouble, right? So a mark and a seal... Uh, 
are the same. It's in the forehead. Okay? Yes. So what we have here is that a mark and a seal are the same thing. Okay? So now all we have to do, brothers and sisters, I'm trying to make this as easy as I possibly can because we have to go to our brothers and sisters in the Sunday churches and we have to be able to explain to them really quickly, very easily, what the mark of the beast is. And once we show them that a mark and a seal are the same thing, right? Then we take it to the next level. We have to find out then where in the Bible it tells us what a seal is, right? Okay, let's go, let, let, go there. Where are we going to go? We're going to go to the book of Romans. Four. Romans chapter 4 and verse what? 11. Romans 4.11. If you want information, remember how we used to call the information number 411? If you want the information on what a mark is, I mean, excuse me, what a seal is, and we've already seen that a mark and a seal are the same thing, so if we want to know what a, what a seal is, Go to 411, Romans 411. Romans 411. And the Bible says he received, and he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of righteousness of the faith which he had not yet being uncircumcised. So, what we see here is that the Bible is saying to us that the sign and seal are the same thing, right? So here's what we're going to do. We're going we're gonna to do this. Uh, a mark and a seal and a sign are the same. Okay? So, a mark, a seal, and a sign are the same thing. Can I get an amen? amen? Is there anybody that opposes this? Okay, forever hold your peace. Okay. So it's the same. Mark, seal, and sign are the same. And so what we have to do is, if, if they're the same, we're going to find out what the mark, seal, and sign is of God. And then we're going to find out what the mark, seal, and sign is of the beast. And we're going to do two things here. Number one, if you want to understand what God's mark, seal, and sign is, who do you go ask? You go ask God. Okay? So that's what we're going to do. We're going to go ask God. We're going to say, Lord, what is your sign, seal, and mark? And he's going to tell us in Exodus chapter 31. Exodus chapter 31. This is exciting stuff. I know we've repeated this before. But, you know, we're coming to the close of probation. And, you know, those angels are going to go through the midst of the land. And it's coming to God's people first. And we're, we're God's people. So we should be what? What should we be doing right now? Sighing and crying between the porch and the altar because we're living in the Day of Atonement. Exodus chapter 31 Verse 13, Exodus 31 and verse 13. The Bible says, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths you f shall keep, for it is a what? Sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth what? Sanctify. And you know what? We need to be sanctified. Amen. And if we, if we don't keep the Sabbath, He can't sanctify us. He can't do that work for us in the heavenly sanctuary because we're saying, Lord, I don't need you. I don't need you. I don't need you. I don't need your Sabbath. And let's get a second witness. Verse 17. It says, It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was what? Refreshed. So the mark of God, so let's do this one. The, 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 the sign, how, how, let's do this. Mark, seal, 
We're, we're, we're signed, sealed, and delivered. Amen? Amen. And sign. Is the seventh day. Can I get an amen? amen. That's, the mark seal of God. That's right. And we just asked him. He just told us. Okay? So, now what do we have to do? Yes? You can also find that in Ezekiel 20, verse 12 and 20. Ezekiel 20? Yes. Let's go there. Ezekiel 20. And the Bible says in verse 12, Moreover, also I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify them. Amen? Amen. Verse 20. And hallow my Sabbaths, they shall be a sign between me and you that ye may know that I am the Lord your God. Amen. Amen. And so what happens is, at the end of the world, if you want to have the sign or the seal, or the mark that you belong to God, you keep the seventh day Sabbath. You keep it holy. Forever it's going to be a sign, right? Okay. So, as we go back to Revelation, let's go back to Revelation chapter 13. Okay? Revelation chapter 13. We're going to look at this story for a minute. And it says here in verse 14, so Revelation 14, 14. 13, 14, excuse me, you're right, 13, 14. Okay, well, you know, let's start in 12. Revelation 13, 12. And exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causes the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. So I'm going to stop right there. Now, we're not going to get into this study right now, and I hope everybody has the ability to show from the Bible who the first beast is. Okay? So we're going to go ahead and, and, and for this presentation, assume that you already know this, that the first beast is the power of Rome, the Roman power, papal Rome, okay? Now, what's interesting is about papal Rome is that they're identified as this beast. So we went to God and we asked God, well, what's your sign? What's your seal? What's your mark? And he told us in a number of places that it's the seventh day Sabbath, right? Mm -hmm. Now, in order to find out what the mark of the beast is, I think we have to go ask the beast, right? Exactly. So, let's go ahead and do that. First of all, let's see what the beast says. There's no scriptural support, it says. Sunday is a Catholic institution and its claim to observance can be defended only on Catholic principles. From beginning to end of Scripture, there is not a single passage that warrants the transfer of weekly public worship from the last day to the first day. Catholic Press, Sydney, Australia, 1900. Okay? So let's establish that now because this is the seventh day. It's God's established thing. That's it, right? It's his institution. According to the Roman Catholic Church, the beast power, Sunday is their institution. Amen? Amen. Now, we have to think about this. If, if at the end of the world, the, the people that are gods f are following and receiving his sign, seal, and mark, and that is the day that they worship on, it would 
lead one to believe just off the surface that the mark of the beast would have something to do with a day that it set aside. Because remember in the beginning, there was a day that came when they came to worship, and it had to do with worship when Cain received this mark. Okay. Now I just love this one because the Catholic Church just lays it right out for us real neat and nice, and it's easy to understand. Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible. And this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. The Catholic record, London, Ontario, September 1, 1923. So the Catholic Church says, look, Sunday, it's the mark of our authority. Now, look, friends. If we take our Bibles back and we go to 2 Thessalonians, where it talks about this man of sin, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, when we'll start in verse 3, right? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3. The Bible says... In verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, that son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called, what? God. They just told us, look, look, the church is above the Bible, they say. Is he not doing this here? Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Friends, if you change God's laws, you're saying that you're a God. Amen. But l read on. Verse 5. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And now ye might know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his what? Brothers and sisters, there's a time associated with this power that has something to do with the mark of the beast. So what we're going to do here is this. I'm going to make a circle around this one. And this is, uh, this is God's. Okay? Now, we have to have a mark, seal, sign of who? The beast. And since the beast power just told us that Sunday is the mark, it's the first day, Sunday. Or the false Sabbath. Okay? And that's the other party there. Now, how do, we, how do we know that this is revealed in his time? Okay? Because history and prophecy agrees. History and prophecy agrees. So, I want to share something with you guys. Uh, I wonder if I can stick this up here for a second. We're going to take a little risk here. How's that? Okay. So, let's, do, let's reveal him in his time. All right. So, what we're going to do is we're going to do a, a timeline. And we're going to start here in 321 A.D. Okay? An event transpired here. What do you think it was? It was the first Sunday law. It was... It was, a, it was this thing that was put together by Pope Sylvester and Constantine, right? And what happens is, if you go into the law that Constantine made, he transferred solemnity from the seventh day to the first day. But this law did not apply to everybody. That's a historical fact. It did not apply to everybody. It did. It did not apply to people in the country, only to people in the cities, okay? 
it did not apply to farmers. But the main thing that happens here, there's a transfer. A transfer of the Sabbath from the true to the false, right? Okay, this takes place in 21 AD. And here's what happens, though. In 538 AD, at the Third Council of Orleans, in 538, Universal Sunday Law goes into place. Yes. In the very year that we teach that the, the, the three horns were finally uprooted, that the Universal Sunday Law goes into place, and it takes place in the city of Orleans. It's where the council came together. And where is Orleans at? It's in France. That's it. I think that's how you spell Orleans. Okay. Oh, uh, thank you, thank you. I, I thought it looked weird. Yeah. Uh, Third Council of Orleans, 538, Sunday Law, Universal. Okay? Now, let's do this here. I'm going to scroll down to here. According to the Roman Catholic Church, Sunday is the mark of its authority, right? So then we can put the year 538 as when the mark of its authority went into place. Amen? Amen. Okay? Does everybody see this? Amen. And, and remember, the Bible says in 2 Th Thessalonians that he's revealed in his what? In his time. So his time begins where? Okay? Now... Let's go to the Bible and let the Bible tell us when this power, when this power changes times, there's a time prophecy associated with it. Okay? So go to Daniel chapter 7. You know what? We're going to make it easier. We're going to go to Revelation chapter 13, where it's dealing directly with the beast's power. Revelation chapter 13. Okay? Revelation 13. Okay? We're going to go to Revelation 13. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 5. And it says, And there were given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue for forty and two what? Months. And we've done this before in each day for a year in Bible prophecy. So according to, to Genesis chapter 7 and chapter 8, there's 30 days in a month. So we have 30 days times 42 equals 1260 days. And then we apply the day year principle. So it's 1260 years. So if you go from the time when he receives his mark of authority, that's when the time begins 1260, okay? 1260 years and we see that that the papacy or Rome receives receives a deadly wound okay it's and that says in verse 3 and I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death and his deadly wound was healed and all the world wandered after the beast now where was it that this takes place at where the Sunday law goes into effect France, right? It takes place in France. And it says, look, talking about the beast, look at verse 10, Revelation 13 and verse 10. It says, he that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. Did the papacy go into captivity? Yes. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and faith of the saints. So what happens is, we know for a fact here that France is the sword of Rome, right? Yep. And this takes place in 538. 
So since the Bible says, if you kill with the sword, you're kill with the sword. And he that leadeth in, into captivity will what? Go into captivity. And it says he has power for 42 what? So at the end of the 42 months, it brings us to the year 1798. And the sword of who comes and removes the papacy? Well, you see how all this fits? It just fits so easy. I mean, I know we have to dig a little bit and a few Bible verses and everything, but we see that this period right here, it, its mark is in authority, and when it's taken out of authority, now, in Europe at least, the Sunday law is not enforced by the papacy anymore. It has its mark of authority, it's taken away. So, in order for the papacy to come back into power, its mark has to be what? Reestablished. So ever since 1798, it's been trying to reestablish its what? Its power and authority. Now let's do our last timeline. Can everybody see here? Okay. This is not, how should I say? We know early writings, page 74, time is no more a test and never will be a test again. But we know that, they, that things that happen aforetime are, are an example for us, okay? So we see here that in 31 AD, a two, excuse me, 321 AD, there had to be a transference of the Sabbath. The Sunday law didn't fully go into effect until 538, okay? I like this way of explaining or identifying 538 because it's a little bit easier than going through all the history books and showing where the three kingdoms were uprooted. Isn't that true? Mm -hmm. It's self-evident. The Catholic Church says that Sunday is the mark of its authority and that's when the authority began. Thus, that starts the 1260. It's pretty easy. Okay? Now, we're going to go to 1893. 1893. So what happens in 1893? World's well, the World's Fair happens, but a law was... Well, no, he signed it in 93, wasn't it? Well, what, it was, was it 92? Yeah, it okay. July and then August. July when Congress did it, August, July 10th, and then August 5th is when he signed it. August 5th, 19, 1892. Yeah. Okay. So let's put that date on there then. August 5. Okay. August 5. 1892, this is, a, this is in the congressional record and, of course, in the presidential record of his signing a law. Yes? It's also in our writings. In it, the it, it's section. in the pioneer section in A.T. Jones's writings. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's what happens. There's a, there's a spending bill that's put before Congress to fund the World's Fair. I don't know, you call it a funding bill or whatever it is. And a recommendation was made in the bill that they close the World's Fair on the Sabbath. So one of the congressmen stood up and he said, well, what's the Sabbath? If you're a Seventh-day Baptist, it says in the record, then the Sabbath is the seventh day, Saturday. And if you're a, another type of Christian, you think it's the first day of the week, Sunday. So if you're going to put this bill in place, you have to make a determination, what is the Sabbath? Is it the seventh day or is it the first day? And the congressman says, you got a point right there. I want it to be the first day. Okay, so then what you're saying is, we want the term Sabbath to mean the first day of the week. That's it. So they voted on the bill, it passes. But as you know, it doesn't become law until what? The president has to sign it. So, as the Zister points out, on August 5th, 1892, President Benjamin Harrison signed that law. Yes? And they voted on two things. One was Saturday was no longer the Sabbath, and the second thing they voted on in Congress was Sunday is now the Sabbath. Yes. They transferred it. So, by an act of Congress, signed into law by the President of the United States, the term Sabbath means Sunday. So the, even though the Sunday law is not being enforced, kind of like this story right here, in 1892, the term 
Sabbath equals Sunday. Isn't that amazing? And since 1892, we've been living in a, in, a, in a country where even though it's not enforced under penalty, that Sunday, that we're, I mean, that's the, the word Sabbath equals what? Sunday. Sunday. So at some point in the future, the Sunday law will enforce it. Now let me just say this. So uh, the, the, the encyclical on climate change, and now the term that's being tossed around after the uh, December uh, uh, meeting that happened where all the late nations of the world came together and they're talking about a what? A green Sabbath, right? A Sabbath rest for the environment. So in the United States, and I want you to think about this for a second. If they pass a law putting in place a green Sabbath, what day does it have to be on? Sunday. Sunday, because the word Sabbath means Sunday. Sunday by an act of Congress and signed in by President of the United States. Okay, now let's move on here. Okay, thank you. So let's move on. The Catechism. <clears throat> Question. Which day is Sabbath? Answer. Saturday is the Sabbath. Question. Why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer. We observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church in the Council of Laodicea AD 336 transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. Now, this is when it was done in the church, but it was done in the government in 321. 321 AD. And notice this, was the transference of Sabbath to Sunday in America done by an act of the church or an act of the government? The government. The government. So the government is enforcing it. Great Controversy, page 606. Because what was the... Excuse me, 607. What was the original title of this presentation? The close of probation. And yet all we've been doing is talking about Mark of, the Beast. Mark of the Beast and the Sunday Law. As the controversy extends to new fields, I was going to write on the back. As the controversy extends into new fields and the minds of the people are called to God's downtrodden law, Satan is astir. The power attending the message will only madden those who oppose it. The clergy will put forth almost superhuman efforts to shut away the light, lest it should shine upon their flocks. By every means at their command, they will endeavor to suppress the discussion of these vital questions. The church appeals to the strong arm of civil power. In this work, papists and Protestants unite. As the movement for Sunday enforcement becomes more bold and decided, the law will be invoked against commandment keepers. They will be threatened with fines and imprisonment, and some will be offered positions of influence and other, and other rewards and advantages as inducements to renounce their faith. But their steadfast answer is, show us from the word of God our error. Now, I want to take a, a pause for a second. I need something to clean this board off with. Okay, we're back. You guys at home are watching. Didn't go anywhere. We just took a two-minute break and stood up. And um, so we're going to repeat this quote right here from Great Controversy, page 607. The church appeals to the strong arm of civil power. And in this work, papists and Protestants unite. As a movement for Sunday enforcement becomes more bold and decided, the law will be invoked against commandment keepers. They will, they will be threatened by fines. So what's the first thing they're going to be threatened with is? Fines. fines. And imprisonment, number two. And some will be offered positions of influence and others and other rewards and advantages for as inducements. 
So we have uh, fines, imprisonment, inducements to renounce their faith, but they will. But the answer, but their answer is, show us from the Word of God our error. So let's move far forward. Um, I just want, I threw this in there because it was in the same area, and I thought it would be uh, pretty good to remind ourselves of this. As the storm approaches. She says this right after she's talking about this. As the storm approaches, what storm is it? Sunday law. Sunday. It's the Sunday law. As the storm approaches, a large class, what size class? A large. a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message but have not been sanctified, sanctified through obedience to the truth, abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition. When does this take place? Before. That's right. <coughs> By uniting with the world. What are they doing? Look, brothers and sisters, how you can tell, and not to say that we should be looking at people, we need to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, but as we, as we see here, they're uniting with the world. By uniting with the world and partaking of its spirit, they have come to view matters in nearly the same light. So, brothers and sisters, as we get involved in worldliness, in all this festivity that's going on, and the eating and drinking and marrying and giving into marriage, and the end is on the way, they have come to view matters as nearly in, in nearly the same light, and when the test is brought, they are prepared to choose the easy, what? Popular side. They're already there. And when the test is brought, and what are the tests going to be? Fines, imprisonments, inducements, no buy, no sell, and then the death decree. Let's go on. <coughs> Men of talent and pleasing address, who once rejoiced in the truth, employ their powers to deceive and mislead souls. They become the most bitter enemies of their former brethren. When Sabbath keepers are brought before the courts to answer for their faith, these apostates are the most efficient agents of Satan to misrepresent and accuse them, and by false reports and innu insinuations, to, in, excuse me, insinuations to stir up the rulers against them. Amen. Unbelievable. Um, well, I hope that this leaves me out because I don't have much talent. All right, let's go on. CTR 366. Christ triumphant. The decree is to go forth that all who will not receive the mark of the beast shall neither buy nor sell, and finally... So the buy nor sell comes first, and finally, that they should be put to death. But the saints of God do not receive this mark. Amen. Amen? All right. So what I want to do here really quickly, oh, oh, I'm, I've gotten ahead of myself. Okay. So what we're going to do, I'm going to put this board up, and then I'm going to take it down again. Because, oh, I'm sorry about that. What we're talking about here, that remember, this is all about the close of probation, right? And we see that the, the Sunday law process is a close of probation. So it's not a singular day. In for, fact, we're told in the spirit of prophecy, the Sunday law enforcement takes place where first? The United States, right? So let's look at this. So... Let's look and see how this is the close of probation. So, the first thing that's going to happen is going to be fines. It's the first step. It's just like Obamacare. You know, they don't throw you into prison right away. 
The first thing is they're going to fine you for not getting insurance, right? Yeah. And then eventually what happens is the fines do what? Increase, right? But you can't get blood out of a stone. And what happens is, is that you are not going to be able to get fined beyond what you financially can afford, right? So what's the next step? Right. Well, if you don't pay the fine or you don't have money to pay the fine, where are you going? Yeah. To the slammer, right? Well, you know, we're told in Spirit of Prophecy that all these things are going to be happening. I'm going to have to come back to it. All these things are going to be happening, and what's going to happen is the world is going to be falling apart, right? There's going to be all kinds of things going because national apostasy is followed by what? National run. So there's probably not going to be enough room in the jails, and they probably aren't going to have enough food to feed us, and on and on and on, right? So then they take another tact. Inducements. It's cheaper to induce you than it is to put you in jail, right? It's easier. So this doesn't work, and then this doesn't work. But let me stop right there. Or does it work? See, we're told that people are going to fall off at every point. So some take, like she said, when the fines come, they're going to choose the easy path. Well, you know, the Sabbath, that's all great, but does it really matter? I'm not going to take those fines. And some will pay the fine, and, but when it comes to imprisonment, oh, man, I can't go to jail. I don't do well in jail. <laughs> and then there's the inducements. Now, here's where the health message comes involved. And I don't, look, all of us are, pretty much almost all of us in this room have a little tinge of white hair, right? <laughs> and, and, and you know what the thing is with the inducements? Well, you're not going to be able to get your medication. Which means if we're having health issues, that could be a death decree right there. So what should we be doing to get ready for the inducement part? Uh, health message, health message right? Self-evident, OK? Well, the inducements don't work. So now what happens? You can't buy or sell. But remember, at every point, what's happening? Right. So what's happening when they fall off and they if they, if they fall off these steps right here, where do they fall off to? They get the mark. And that mark of the beast is an irreversible decision. You can't say, I'll just go along for now and get the mark, and then later I'll change. Because I'm not ready. Because what's going to happen is, those that didn't get ready for this period right here now, when they get here, they're not going to be able to do anything. Because... If you didn't move into the country already, when no buy, no sell comes, you're going to be in a serious situation. Because that's where the food is grown. Mm -hmm. And if you're out in the country with your friends, and you guys are exchanging seeds and helping each other till gardens and stuff like that, we're going to be eating like kings and queens. Now, notice this. This is not the great time of trouble. This is the little time of trouble. And she says that we need to move into the country where we can raise our own provisions because in the future the time of the 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 the, the time of no buy no sell is going to be very serious. So those of us that like to eat, well, <laughs> this period right here, if you don't have the ability or you're not in a place where you can grow your own food, you're going to be in trouble. And by the way, why do you need to go into the country to raise your own food? Because if you do it in the city, they're going to steal it. And it's illegal to do it in the cities in a lot of places across the country. Yes. Now, people will snitch on you if you have a garden. Absolutely. Now, we know, we know for a fact that the no buy, no sell doesn't work because, as Jerry Franklin likes to say, you don't put a death decree in, in place for people that died from starvation. Right? So then the death decree finally goes into place. It's, it doesn't seem possible to us now that this could happen. But as step by step by step, 
the death decree finally goes into place. And we know that when the death decree goes into place, that's it. Close of probation. Michael stands up. And what is the main issue? Sunday law time. In other words, this is the Sunday law enforcement time. It is the close of probation. And some will fall here. Their probation is closed. Here, 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 here. Yes. So the mark is the mark of their authority. That's correct. Yes. Speaking of times and imprisonment, as of about 10 to 12 weeks ago, about three months. Hold on one second, because we are videotaping, and they're not going to be able to hear you. Unless, Bill, you, do you want to pause it for a second? As of three, well, it's for the fines and imprisonments. As of three months ago, maybe 10 weeks ago, uh, 16 attorney generals, and I sent the article out, mm -hmm. came up with an inquisition mm -hmm. for those who will not go with the climate change, and it's in that order. Mm -hmm. Fines, oh. imprisonment, and inducements. Yes. And Al Gore is at the head of this. Yeah. Well, and they're it, getting ready to implement this inquisition as soon as the climate change goes through. Yes, this is the natural order of things. <laughs> and you can see how all these things strike, the, all these things strike right at the heart of each one of us individually. You know? Well, some of us are broke, so we don't care. Fine us. Well, some of us, well, we don't care about going to jail. We've visited a couple times in the past. We don't have families. And then there's the inducements. And well, there's nothing you could do or say that would make me do this. And then no buy, no sell. Do you know that we're told, and in, in, uh, Mrs. White tells us, that those that have not suffered privation in their life are not going to be able to go through this process. What did you say? Repeat that? We're told in the spirit of prophecy that those that haven't suffered privation in their life aren't going to be able to go through this time. It's in the Empress's dream. Yeah. So what happens is, if you're saying, I can't sleep there, I can't eat that, I can't do that, what can I say? You, you, if you, if you, ha you can't get an experience during this time. You've either had the experience or you haven't get the experience. So I recommend, I mean, I highly recommend, sell everything you have if you live in the city and get into the country and, and secure yourself to modest dwelling a modest dwelling where you can raise your own provisions because in the future the problem of buying and selling will be a serious one. Secure it. Secure it. That's right. Okay. And that modest dwelling might be a tent, it might be an RV, a cabin, a camper, whatever it is, you need to get in the country. Okay, let's move forward. Uh, spiritual gifts. 34. God leads his people on step by step. He brings them up to different points. Do you like my steps? Mm -hmm. He brings them on. And you know what's fascinating? I never even knew that until just now. <laughs> that's, that's neat. God leads his people on step by step. He brings them up to different points, which are calculated to manifest what is in the heart. I can't do that. Some endure at one point, but fall off at the next. At every advance point, the heart is tested and tried a little closer. Those who come up to every point and stand every test and overcome, be the price what it may, have heeded the counsel of the true witness, and they will be fitted up, fitted for translation by the latter rain. Same area. I saw four angels. Oh, no, it's not the same area. I'm sorry. So here we have it. We have this situation here where we're going to be tested at every point. And at each one of these points, if we fall off, that's the close of probation. It's not an individual day, but yet it is the Sunday law time period. So during the Sunday law, the probation of people will be closing as they're brought up to these different tests. Okay, now we want to have a, a, another triangulation. We want to see another event that's transpiring uh, 
as probation is closing, okay? Um, let's read this. I saw four angels standing on four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, and I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the what? Because that is associated with the close of probation. And he cried, saying, Hurt not the earth, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. These angels now holding the winds of strife, waiting for the church of God to prepare for his coming. The sealing angel goes through Jerusalem to place the seal of the living God on the foreheads of the faithful. While this work goes forward, Turkey stands as a national what? Guide Guidepost to the world that men may know what is going on in the sanctuary above. God's eye is upon his people. He never leaves himself without a witness in, in the world. No man knows when Turkey will take its departure from Europe, but when that move is made, Earth's history will be short. Then it will be said, He that is just, let him be just unjust. Uh, excuse me. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. Today is the day of preparation. The fate of Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome is recorded for the edification margin of the nations of today. And the lessons taught by all center in the events just before us. While the world watches Turkey, let the servant of God watch the movements of his great high priest whose ministry for sin is almost over. Now, who wrote that? Stephen Haskell. Now, let me just tell you a little bit about this brother and about the time period in when he, which he wrote this. Stephen Haskell, there's his picture right there, began preaching for First Day Adventists in 1853. But the same year, after reading a tract on the Sabbath, he became a Sabbath keeper at the age of 20. Following some years in self-supporting work in New England, he was ordained in 1870 and became president of the New England Conference, serving from 1870 to 1887. While in that position, he served also as president of the California Conference. Isn't that fascinating? <laughs> and of the Maine Conference. What a busy guy. Oops. In 1869, while young, Stephen Haskell was directing the New England Mission. A group of women met in his home and organized the Vigilant Missionary Society. He organized the first conference tract and missionary society soon afterwards, which became the forerunner of the Adventist Book Centers today. His interest in literature ministry should not be surprising, for a tract on the Sabbath had brought Haskell into the church. In 1880, he originated what would be known as the Bible Readings Plan, following Ellen White's instruction to do more teaching and less Amen. preaching. Amen. It, was a, it was a success from the beginning. Haskell, accompanied by James and Ellen White on several speaking tours, he also worked closely with them as a member of the General Conference Committee in the mid-1870s. He had led out in the establishment of the South Lancaster Academy, later known as the Atlantic Union College, 1882, and wrote several important books on the sanctuary and Bible prophecy. On January 3, 1875, at the dedication of the Battle Creek College, Ellen White received a vision in which the angel mentioned Australia in connection with future publishing efforts. Haskell found her report of the experience inspiring. And 10 years later, he led a group of workers to Australia and New Zealand, pioneering the mission work there. <coughs> Did this guy go along with the visions of Ellen White or what? Yeah. Haskell made a world tour a world tour on behalf of the missionary work in the mid, in eight, excuse me, in 1889 and 1890, visiting Europe, South Africa, India, China, Japan, and Australia. He taught Bible in Avondale College in Australia, 1896 to 1899, while Ellen White was there. I, I rejoice that I had the help of brother and sister Haskell, Ellen White. Ellen White. These God-appointed 
to be my companions in establishing the school in this place. So Ellen White calls this guy a companion. Ellen White wrote more letters to Haskell than any other church leader. Their ministries span much of the same time period, beginning for, for him at age 20 and for her at age 17. They often shared the same concerns. She lived to 87 and he to 90. At the time of her death, the only picture in Ellen White's bedroom of a non-family member was that of Stephen Haskell. And Stephen Haskell says that Turkey is the guidepost for the close of probation. So here we are, brothers and sisters, and Turkey is in the news every day. Every day. You can't turn on the news. And, and, and I just read a series of events that are taking place. And as the sister said earlier today, Turkey's tanks rolled across the border yesterday into Syria. And it's made the promise that it's going to go to Jerusalem. And according to what the pioneers said, that when these events transpire, the close of probation will be getting ready to take place. And we're seeing them take place right now. We're seeing that, that the, the Church of Rome and that the United States and that the Protestant churches are, are, are joining hands and that they're calling for a green Sabbath. And we know from history that the word Sabbath in America means Sunday. Sunday. The Sunday law is coming. These events will take place, fines, imprisonments, inducements, no buy, no sell, the death decree, and the end of human history will follow soon after that. And so what are we doing? I, I, I left out the last one that I, I wanted to talk about. Ellen White talks about in connection, connection with this, we have no time to lose. We need to get the message out there we need to take our time, our means, our money, our whatever, and dedicate it, lay it on the altar of this work to get this message out here. Because soon, brothers and sisters, but no buy, no sell is going to come. You won't be able to use your money anyway. It'll be laying in the streets, the Bible says, and there'll be who to pick it up? No one. Because no money is not going to be used. It's going to be a card or whatever. If you don't have whatever they give you, if you get the mark of the beast, you won't be able to buy or sell. And so, friends, we don't have a, a, a moment to lose. We need to be investing our money and our time in heaven. Amen? Because things are getting ready to wrap up. Well, I don't want to hold you any more today. So let's go ahead and have a closing word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we see events that are transpiring before us. They're associated with the close of probation. Turkey is on its move. And the one who told us this information, Brother Haskell, was a confidant of Ellen White. Wrote more letters to him than anybody. The only non-family member to have his picture near her bed. He was preaching the straight message, but many today say that message is false. But Lord, history is repeating, and events in the Middle East indicate to us that human history is about to be over, as Daniel 11, 40 to 45 are coming to their final climax. And as these things are going on, all the world is wandering after the papacy, wondering what's next. And the United States is making provisions to set up a papal Sabbath under the guise of environment. And Lord, we can see very clearly now that things are getting ready to take place and the final movements will be rapid ones. And yet we're asleep. Even those of us that teach these things, we're asleep. We need to be woken up to these events. We need to commit ourselves to the work because there's coming a nighttime when no man can work. Let us be about our, your business, Lord, and let's get our resources, use them in different ways, in evangelism, in publishing, and getting out these books, buying great numbers of great controversies, and letting them fall out like the leaves of autumn. Because the prophet says when the Sunday law comes, what good will it do then? And Lord, help us to commit ourselves to living in the country where we can grow our own food and be 
ready for when these events transpire. Lord, thank you so much for this warning and for the counsel given is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.